We're continuing our studies of the citric acid cycle in Chapter 14, and in this lesson we'll be looking at the last four steps of that cycle. Recall it is a cyclic pathway. We begin by adding an acetyl group from acetyl-CoA to oxaloacetate, and by the time we finish the cycle, we need to regenerate that oxaloacetate molecule. In the last video lesson, we stopped with step four, where we produced succinyl-CoA. We had accomplished a goal of adding two carbons in the form of acetyl, and then extracting two carbons as CO2. But we need to be able to, cut, to convert this succinyl group back to oxaloacetate. So the next step is step five. We'll start with succinyl-CoA. We're actually going to displace that coenzyme A cofactor with the phosphoryl group, a phosphate. So we're going to exchange a thioester bond on succinyl-CoA for a phosphoester bond on succinyl phosphate. And here's our coenzyme A coming off. So it's driven by cleavage of that thioester bond and that releases a sizable amount of energy and so at first glance it might seem like this would be an irreversible reaction but we're only halfway through with this step. In the next part of the process we're going to take the phosphoryl group from succinyl and eventually transfer that to GDP. However, we're going to transfer that temporarily to a histidine side chain on the enzyme, and that's illustrated here. The histidine residue in blue will transfer the phosphoryl group to histidine. So we have a phosphohistidine uh, enzyme intermediate, and there's our product succinate. The enzyme will then transfer the phosphoryl group to GDP to form GTP. Remember, this is another example of substrate level phosphorylation. We're forming a covalent bond, we're creating order, and that has a large unfavorable change in delta G. And so if we sum these two together, the gain of energy by breaking the thioester bond and the input of energy or requirement of energy to form the phosphoester bond to make GTP, the sum of those two together is still slightly favorable but near equilibrium. So overall it's a reversible reaction and the enzyme is actually named for the reverse reaction. Now we begin with our substrate succinate for our next step, step six. If we compare this to oxaloacetate, we see we have carboxyl groups on carbons one and four. We have a methylene group at position number three, but we need a carbonyl group at position number two, and we don't have an oxygen atom. And so this is the first step of accomplishing that goal. We're going to oxidize succinate to form fumarate, and so we displace two carbon-hydrogen bonds to form a double-bonded uh, carbon atoms in positions two and three. That represents an oxidation, and we're going to transfer those electrons to an FAD cofactor of the enzyme succinate dehydrogenase. So we've accomplished our goal of oxidizing succinate to form fumarate, but we need to be able to re-oxidize that cofactor on the enzyme. And that's the next part of the process. This enzyme is actually an integral membrane protein. It's present within the mitochondrial membrane. And for that reason, to transfer those electrons to another carrier, that carrier must be present in the membrane. In other words, it needs to be a lipid-soluble electron carrier. And so the electrons are passed to ubiquinone, Q, or coenzyme Q. Two electrons and two protons are passed to Q to form ubiquinol, illustrated here as QH2. And so the original FAD form of the cofactor for this enzyme is regenerated, and we've passed those electrons to Q. This is the first time we've encountered this particular electron carrier, and we'll see this carrier again when we looked at electron transport in chapter 15. Now we have our fumarate substrate for our step 7. Remember we need an oxygen at that carbon number 2 position so we're simply going to hydrate this bond, add water, and now we have an oxygen at position number 2. And so we, there's only one step remaining and that's our final oxidation carried out by malate dehydrogenase. So we're going to oxidize the hydroxyl group on malate to form oxaloacetate, and those electrons will be passed to NAD+, and there's our final product in the pathway, NADH. The passing of the electrons to NADH 
represents a recovery of energy, but overall it's an unfavorable process. However, the product, oxaloacetate, is immediately used in the next step of the cycle, the citrate synthase reaction, and that pulls the reaction forward. Now that we've looked at all the steps of the citric acid cycle, we want to see how the cycle is regulated, and we'll see that there are multiple control points. We want to see what those control points are, and why are there multiple control points.